So we all know that the cyber in the cybersecurity space, network security is one of the biggest spend areas when it comes to like VPNs, firewalls, IDS, IPS devices, and so on. Uh, the the big issue is that the that these areas haven't changed as much, even though the world around us has changed dramatically. Uh, the result of all of this is that we see that there are a large number of security breaches on any given day. And some recent statistics have indicated that about 6 million records are lost or stolen almost every day. So clearly, guys, we got something wrong there. And we need to rethink the way we need to think about security in general. And that's where we decided that, hey, let's start a company around it. And called it Banyan, not Banyan Vines from the old days. This is more like the Banyan, like the Banyan tree, whatnot. So it's, uh, it kind of, it's rooted in the network layer. Say that again. It's rooted in the network side of the story, but not in the network layer. So the basic premise of the way we decided we want to do Banyan was that we felt that network is absolutely the wrong layer to build security in. And so our premise was that network cannot be trusted, and so we need to elevate the conversation away from the network while building a security solution. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about. So to introduce myself a little bit, uh, I'm uh, uh, Giant, CEO and co-founder at Banyan. And I will be mostly covering the, uh, like the principles behind why we started Banyan and how are we thinking about the problem and how we are different from the probably other companies that you've seen so far. Uh, this will be followed by, uh, our, uh, by Ashish, who will talk about our market uh, market overview. Then we'll go over the product, and then uh, Jacob, even he, uh, who's going to be the he's, the he's the head of sales, and he's going to talk about the customer journey, has promised to try to keep it less salesy. So that's going to be a fun thing to watch. So with that, <laughs> sorry, Jacob, I had to take a swipe at you. <laughs> All right. So with that, let me uh, let me talk about how we are, uh, you know, like how we are thinking about the world. We are. Uh, so as you think about heading to the perimeter-free world, I think the, when, I, when I think about the world and you know, how it has moved to where we are today, uh, the, the main company that comes to my mind is VMware, who was one of the pioneers in this area of virtualization. And that has kind of created like the foundation for a lot of the stuff that's been built today, including the different types of clouds. And the reason I'm so passionate about VMware and a lot of the uh, you know, uh, ideas behind it is because of uh, my background, and I think this is a great time to actually talk about uh, my background to you guys and how it ties to VMware. So uh, I was doing my PhD at uh, Stanford working with Professor Mendel Rosenblum. Uh, Mendel Rosenblum, for those who don't know, is one of the founders of Banyan. Uh, sorry, not Banyan, too. That would be great. No, he's one of the founders of VMware along with uh, Diane Green and his two students. And uh, yeah, I was late to the game because it was already started by the time I got there, but it was amazing to be next to him as the company grew. And a lot of learnings that we're actually going to talk about in this is like based on what we learned from there. And so once I uh, finished my PhD, at some point I ended up at VMware and then started looking at uh, different, uh, different aspects of uh, you know, like virtualization and security and trying to see what's the right thing to do. A cool technology that I invented, uh, co-invented, so to speak, at VMware was this ability to do instant VMs. So instant VMs allows you to have new VMs, you know, bring up on the, in the virtual world in as little as half a second, as opposed to what, you know, typically when you boot up a VM, it takes a full minute to come up. So the implications of that were uh, humongous in terms of like the you know different use cases it could be applied to, and so we started seeing that this kind. Of, but but I think the most interesting part of the whole uh, experience there was how dynamic and distributed uh, the world was becoming, and how this would be how the technologies like this would become the fundamental uh, building block, so to speak, of this new world we are entering. So. We also started seeing the rise of Amazon at that point, and we started looking at hybrid clouds and multi-clouds, and the rise of containers and Kubernetes ecosystems. And it was, uh, and each time we looked at it, it was like, wow, the, the world is getting more and more distributed and dynamic. And so, what is the, you know, what is the, uh, what, is, what are the problems to be solved out here? And I thought it was going to be performance and operations related, and so we started focusing on that and thinking about it at VMware. And then I was like, okay, maybe I should get out of the bubble that I'm in and start thinking about the problem more holistically. And so I got out and we had a lot of customer interviews at that point, and we figured that, interestingly and surprisingly, the number one problem that most people came back to us was about you know, security and secure access to these fast-changing, dynamic, and distributed applications. And I was like, okay, that's a great problem statement, and how is, what is the right way to build a solution for the new world we are entering? 
And an even more interesting part of it was, it was not just about, hey, you have these applications coming out, and you need to worry about how they're talking to each other. It was more about users and how the users are actually securely trying to access these dynamically fast-changing distributed applications. And if you look at the users, they went from their back offices to start using all kinds of devices. And if you look at, you know, uh, right now there are about 4 billion smartphones today that are getting accessed from all these uh, millions of public hotspot points, and the performance is getting better every day, indicating that this is becoming the primary medium in which many of the employees right now are working on company resources. And the other cool part is, if you think about it, the number of loosely coupled users, as we call, about, uh, about a company, which is not just employees. If you talk, talk, start talking about partners, vendors, suppliers, contractors, in many companies, the number of those actually even exceed the number of employees. And that's amazing. So with that kind of a new world that we were entering, the question was, how are we going to enable secure access in this new world? And that became our big problem statement. So, so, so to just take you over through the three trends that we saw, we start off in, in a couple of decades, we look at, you know, we start around uh, on-premises or data centers as being the primary starting point, and we kind of went to this hybrid cloud model that we had things like VMware and some things in the cloud kind of co-hosted, and this is, I think, probably true in many of the companies, especially the bigger enterprise companies today. And if you go to like more like mid-market and much newer companies, you're seeing them mostly, uh, mostly present themselves in the multi-cloud world, where they are on AWS, GCP, Azure, and so on. So this is kind of the trend. And the, again, the most interesting part about this trend, again, was not just the aspect of you know, more compute resources, more operational abilities, and so on. It was about how the perimeter that we knew and loved, so to speak, over the last two decades has kind of completely dissolved. And now we are entering this perimeter-free world that we have completely uh, dynamic users and distributed applications accessing each other. So uh, just to summarize, I thought I'll just put one slide out by saying that even though the operations and other parts of the world have evolved quite a bit. We're seeing more of the same when it comes to a lot of the security, and this is one of the examples of a box. Hopefully there's no uh, company name listed out there, but it's just, a, <laughs> just something to show that you know, we're still, security is one area that has lagged behind a lot of these other areas that have gotten innovation. So with that, I think to summarize, there, were, there are two big tectonic shifts that I want to talk about out here. One is around distributed and hybrid multi-cloud applications, where we started from the data center, and we've ended up in different environments as cloud, uh, you know, cloud servers, cloud native web applications across all these um, one or more clouds. And on the other side, we've ended up with a distributed and dynamic mobile workforce where the office worker is now supplanted, so to speak, with, uh, with, a, oops, yeah, there you go, with a remote worker, contractor, developer, partner, and so on. And they're bringing their own devices at the end of the day to access these. So the big question is, how are we going to have a great way to provide secure access in this new and dynamic and fast changing environment? So with that, we said, let's step back a little bit and see how do we, uh, given the dynamic and distributed nature of the world, what should be our guiding principles when we actually create a solution for this? And we were like, let's boil it down to like three of them so that it's easy to remember and easy to work with. And we said, first one is, that enterprises are actually losing control over the network today. If you think about it, as the applications move to the cloud, we have very little, enterprises in general have very little control over what goes into the network because it's the cloud, like AWS and others that actually control the network at the end of the day. So that means a solution that we designed for overall a sanity of the, of the layer needs to be something which is completely network independent. So that was the first requirement for our solution. Uh, second one was around like, you know, the, if you think about, again, if, as long as you have a perimeter, you have something called north-south and east-west traffic, where north-south is going from outside the company to inside the company, and east-west being from inside the company to another part of the company. And if you, if you imagine that perimeter suddenly going away, there's no more north-south and east-west traffic anymore. And so in that world, we need to design a solution that's actually pervasive. It's not just limited to inside or outside. It's, it's actually towards both. And finally, this whole security is becoming increasingly complex to manage. As we said, you know, when things start changing all the time around you, how are you going to keep tabs of it? Right? And so the key observation there was we need to empower users. We need to bring users into the equation, not just security admins, but also employees and partners and so on, so that they become part of this ecosystem as you create a new solution. Uh, not surprisingly, these principles I'm talking has very similar analogies to VMware. And I think that's, again, because of 
I would blame it all on Mendel for his influence, but the, the problem is that if you think about when VMware came about, there were like physical servers all over the place, and they had to build something that was physical server independent or hardware independent to actually get the, get the level of control that people needed. They had, to, they had to make it truly pervasive in the sense that they had to make it work on all types of servers and all types of applications, not just you know, one type of server, one type of application. So that's what would make it more pervasive in the, in the ecosystem. And then finally, sorry, finally on the, uh, on the empowering users front, they actually did an amazing job by making the IT admin the, the hero of the whole model so that they were able to tell them, able to give them the power to kind of, you know, hey, I'm going to give you a CPU with 20 gigahertz in like five minutes, right? Not in five, probably it's faster now, like more like a minute when I was there, five minutes. But I'm saying it's like it's things have changed dramatically when you, when you, Things can change dramatically when you empower users, and that's the third big pillar, so to speak, of our principle, guiding principles that we want to embrace while we build, while we come up with a solution for that. So with that, we are like, okay, let's me, uh, you know, when you talk about secure access, there are a lot of ways to think about it, and I was like, okay, let's let's start going back to the uh, basic primary principles of what secure access is all about, right? So and what are the components that make this make them? Right, so if you, at a very high level, this is, what is secure access? Secure access is an entity of some kind trying to access an application or data and going through a channel to access it. So this is, in short, the simplest, fastest summary of secure access you level here, right? So the cool part that we had to do was to figure out, like, what are the important components that would actually enable this access to be secure and what are the areas that we need to concentrate on given the guiding principles we already went through about distributed and dynamic nature of things. So the first one we identified was around quantified trust. So, so today, if you look at trust, it's more about, hey, can A access B or not? I think we've entered this world now where we need to have gradients about you know, who can access what at, you know, based on a lot of contextual information around when they're accessing that information. So that is quantified trust. I'll go over each of these in a little more detail in the next slide, but I'll just give you a high level feel out here. The second part is about continuous authorization. It's not about, hey, I'm just going to authenticate you to some resource and I get out of the way. It's about continuously looking at what's happening at any point in time and seeing whether it is valid or invalid and based on that allow or disallow access. So that becomes a key second principle or second uh, component, so to speak, that we need to follow or build in this new company. And the third part that we wanted to build was around enforcement. And I, I'm uh, emphasizing distributed aspect of things out here because as things get more and more distributed, there are a lot of these, you, you'll see a lot of centralized uh, control planes today where data you know, is, is like going through a centralized point before going to the different endpoints. And that becomes a really hard uh, you know, problem to solve because you end up, getting, you end up losing your security uh, posture very quickly because you don't no longer get end-to-end -end security and scalability that you would potentially get otherwise. So with these three components in mind, let, let's go into uh, the way I've was thinking about doing this was going to each of these and then say what would be the ideal way to design a solution for them given the principles that we've already laid out, being it network independent, pervasive, and empowering users, so that we are all in the same uh, frame of mind. So quantified trust. Uh, quantified trust, again, is basically a way to uh, a way to assign security to gauge the confidence we place in the different entities that are accessing the resources. I think. It's easiest to explain this with an analogy with credit card and credit scores. So if you think about, uh, if you think about the world today, like let's say you want to, you want to get mortgage somewhere. It's, it's not about, most people can get mortgage. It's not about not getting a mortgage or, or getting a mortgage. It's about how much mortgage you're going to get. And that is dependent on a lot of factors that constitute who you are. And, and what, how have you built your credit history? How many credit cards do you have? How, how often do you pay your bills and so on? So in a similar manner, we want to build a quantified trust, a score, so to speak, that captures the essence of who the entity is that's actually accessing the endpoint. So with that in mind, let's look at the three principles and see how we've kind of, uh, how, it, how the right solution needs to get laid out based on that. For it to be network independent, it can no longer rely on things like IP addresses, VPCs, ports, and so on. It has to be much more at the level of users, devices, and apps. When it comes to being pervasive, we have to collect, it's not just about we install some tools that collect signals. It has to be much more about us getting these kinds of signals from various security tools that are already installed in these companies and try to make sense of them to kind of provide you the final trust. So that's exactly what your credit card companies do as well. They look at 
how your how what's your activity in different you know different stores different areas of the world what not and then based on that they come up with some way of thinking about how to quantify you as far as they, they are concerned to uh, to gauge your to gauge your credit worthiness in our case we're gauging the trustworthiness and finally we want to be able to have the ability to see the users to have the ability to see and improve their own scores you had a question? Oh, yeah. Yes. When you, you have say, a yeah. <laughs> I have a lot. So when you say network independent based on posture and so forth, can you define <laughs> what's part of that posture check? What's part of the users? What's part of the devices? Give me some more details because that's just typical MDM language. I want a lot more. Like, for example, one of my use cases I always bring up, I'm in my office somewhere in the States. I'm allowed access to everything. Mm -hmm. I go down to the local coffee shop, it's in the bottom of the building, and now I have access to just my email, mm -hmm. but nothing confidential. Mm -hmm. Then I go and travel on a train to yet another location. Mm -hmm. I'm on the train. Well, I'm on a train moving at 35, 50 miles an hour in the U.S. That's about as fast as they go. And now I have access to one or two more apps. Yep. I end up in Chicago. Chicago, I walk into my local office. And now I have access to almost everything I had in my original office. Yep. Now I go and take a plane to China. I get access to nothing yep. while I'm on the plane. And I end up in China. I get access to a Chinese, Chinese local yep. email server. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's the type of posture in identity and device and everything I want to see. Yep. I can't agree with you more. But I don't see how you get that out of what you just told me. <laughs> Perfect. We're, we got that. We got we have, we so going that is, uh, I want see. some details to go with yeah. what Right. So I think okay. in the product section, we'll go into Yeah. So the that, way that we've uh, organized the talk is to lay out the principles in the beginning to kind of tell you what kind of, what would be the ideal shape, which is what you're talking about. And then in the subsequent chapters, as we go deeper into each of these sections, we're going to tell you more about each of them so that it's much easier to, easier to consume in that way. We're waiting here, to hear more. Layers. Yep. We're we waiting want, to hear we more. We want more. Of yep. course. That's <laughs> the whole point of talking to you for an hour and a half. And, and, out and, uh, and a, uh, hopefully a live demo to show some of these scenarios. Cool. Yeah, but I think I couldn't have articulated it better than the way you articulated it in terms of all the factors that need to be taken into account. And I think the, the cool part is that if you, I think I have a Next thing out here, yeah, I think this is directly in, uh, to talk to you some of your point that a lot of the world today, when they're talking about this kind of contextual or conditional access, they mostly think in terms of authentication, in terms of giving you access to the endpoint and then getting out of the way, getting to the application, so to speak, and getting out of the way. And a lot of the stuff that needs to be done, the work that is missing, is about you get your token or whatnot for hours. In those, you know, it takes like a second to get the token, but it takes you eight hours to then you can do whatever the hell you want with it, right? So the question is, how do you, what do you do in those eight hours to kind of capture what the user is doing and use that information uh, to, you know, gauge the trustworthiness of individuals and so on? So that is where I think a lot of the missing pieces lie, and we'll go over it in the demo as well. The other, as I think this directly leads to the authorization piece, and everybody knows authentication is just to help you log into a log into a particular session. But beyond that, it's all about authorization to provide least privileged access to uh, very specific resources in the company, very specific APIs, very specific uh, MySQL tables, very specific you know shards of uh, MySQL table, and so on. So that's kind of what we're talking about as a least privileged access. And the, how do these principles that we talked about so far apply to these, uh, apply to continuous authorization? First of all, given that we are trying to get away from the network layer, we cannot rely on things like VPNs and network firewalls anymore, which can, which can help you with some kind of a broad network level access to systems, whether it's VPCs or set of applications present in those VPCs and so on. So we need to get more towards a model that is much more closer to the application on this. When it comes to pervasive aspect of this, the, a, a right solution needs to think about not just a user to service access, which is what a lot of the contextual places are there, where a lot of contextual access and other kinds of things are doing today. But it's much more about, it's also about applications talking to other applications. In what context? Is the application running in the same VPC? Is it running on a different VPC? Is it running on a hardware that is busted, you know, or software that is busted, rather? You know, things like that. So those things need to be taken into account when you talk about continuous authorization. 
And finally, it comes down to about empowering users again. And here again, it's about coming up with a simple abstraction of the policy engine and ability to provide just very simple high-level policies that in turn get assimilated into much more fine-grained lower-level policies that get disseminated to the endpoints for, for, the, for enforcement purposes. And so the industry trends you must have already heard in this domain are things like zero trust. How many of you are familiar with zero trust? Yeah, everybody knows about it. Great. And so zero trust, the definition is never trust, always verify. But it's basically talking about least privileged access to resources. And the question is, how do we enable this kind of least privileged access to resources in, in, in the product that we build? And the other part is about how many of you have heard of Google Beyond Corp? Okay. So I think a couple of them. So Google, in, a, in a very high level, Google Beyond Corp was an, was an experience uh, that Google went through as they got rid of the VPNs inside the company in a way that they could, they, they actually are hitting all the scale problems before anybody else. And they saw that VPNs just don't work anymore for their environment. And so their whole journey of how they went through getting rid of it are the principles that were laid out in these Beyond Corp papers. And I think those, those are amazing reads. And we've leveraged some of that in our system as well. But remember that Google had complete control over the hardware, software, <laughs> applications, everything else. But now bringing those concepts to a Wild West enterprise is a completely different story. And that's where a lot of the work would have to go in. And finally, talking about distributed enforcement, um, so, and so I think th this is another key here where we want to enforce policies as much as possible really close to the application. And that gives you a lot of benefits. You get end-to-end -end security. You get scalability because there are like you know, multiple points which are enforcing your policies. And finally, even you get high performance because you're not going through weird middle hops. Like for example, if I'm accessing an application that is uh, out here in Oregon, I'm not going all the way to Hong Kong to come back to o Oregon to access it. Right? So trying to, trying to uh, create your policy enforcement really close to the application is one of the critical bits. So how are these principles going to apply here? It cannot be at the network layer, so it has to be more at the service layer, which is layer 6, layer 7. It has to be applicable, again, to not just users or devices. It has to be applicable to applications. And finally, I think the critical bit, again, to empower users to be part of the equation is we need to be able to visualize these things with maps and graphs and so on, as opposed to the conventional table approach that most people use today. Uh, the, uh, uh, the interesting industry trends that have kind of captured the essence of this is in the Kubernetes world, so to speak. How many of you know Istio? Have you heard of Istio? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so Istio and Envoy are like part of what are, what are called the, the new generation of, uh, they're called service mesh. So the idea is that you want to create a layer that's really close to the application where you're Enforcing and you know enforcing policies at the layer six, layer seven level, as opposed to the networking layer, as much as possible. And this this is amazing because this has like you know this is again getting rid of a lot of the requirements around firewalls and so on. But it's it's kind of in its niche right now, and the ability to bring it to the rest of it, rest of the world, and users and so on is the much more harder problem that, that needs to get solved. So with that, I'm trying to I'm going to bring it all together in the. The three pieces we talked about, one was around we need to have quantified trust for principles so that we have some level of confidence about who's accessing it. We need to have continuous authorization once they start accessing to make sure that every API, every resource they're trying to access is actually authorized before allowing access. And finally, we need to keep the enforcement as distributed as possible for scalability and performance reasons and security reasons too. So with that, that is the basis for what we've created and what we call the Banyan Continuous Zero Trust Platform. And the following talks are going to go into much more depth into each of these pieces and tell you how we went about building it.